Greetings, my name is Shirley Collado and I am the president and CEO of College Track. I am thrilled to welcome you to this program and so proud that College Track is partnering with Chalkbeat for the student panel portion of this event. College Track is an organization that equips talented students from all walks of life to navigate systemic barriers and earn a bachelor's degree. At College Track, we believe that a bachelor's degree is an important tool that unlocks a life of opportunity, choice, and power, particularly for first-generation college students and for students from communities that are underserved. And during this program, a group of our very own College Track scholars will be in conversation around the insights and strategies they've developed to center their social, emotional well-being during COVID. Their determination to thrive and succeed through a pandemic, through social and political upheaval, through a climate crisis, both affirms our shared humanity and provides us with a glimpse of the strength and resilience that can be found within our nation's next generation of leaders. I want to offer my deep appreciation to our College Track scholars for being so generous with their time and perspectives and to Chalkbeat for hosting this important program. And I thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoy this really special event. Greetings. My name is Nicole Avery Nichols, and I am the Editor-in-Chief of Chalkbeat. Thank you for joining us as we explore the COVID pandemic's impact on student mental health and some of the ways this unprecedented time period has affected the well-being of school communities across the country. Last summer, before school started, we had hoped that this year would be truly a comeback year, a return to school buildings and a more familiar routine. But through our reporting and ongoing conversations with teachers, students, and parents, we quickly realized that the stresses and uncertainty, the isolation, the separation caused by the pandemic has laid the foundation for a longer, more complex, come back, especially as it relates to mental health. During the school year, our journalists at Chalkbeat have hosted a series of conversations about COVID and mental health in Detroit, Memphis, and Philadelphia. These conversations, which included educators and students, touched on many things, including how isolation, depression, the threat of violence, specifically the threat of community gun violence, as well as the debates about what curriculum is taught in schools, how all those things seep into the classroom and inevitably impacts social and emotional health and learning outcomes in some cases. In this, our culminating mental health event, we seek to continue the conversation in hopes of making sure that more schools actually get the tools needed and support needed to help students and teachers through mental health challenges and setbacks. Thank you to each of our expert panelists for taking the time to provide their insight and thanks also to the brave student panelists for sharing thoughts on their mental health journeys. And thanks also to our presenting partner, College Track. Thank you all for joining this vital conversation. Hi everyone, this is Kobe Levin. I'm an education reporter with Chalkbeat in Detroit, and I'm so honored to be moderating a panel tonight uh, with our terrific students who are gonna discuss mental health and with Blair Imani, um, a mental health influencer and expert. Um, so let's jump right into it. I want to ask folks to talk a little bit about how their mental health has been affected by the pandemic over the last couple of years. Um, and why don't I kick it straight to Blair, um, just, just to, to launch us off here. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Blair Mani. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, as Kobe said, I'm an educator and influencer. I talk a lot about mental health. I actually just had a great heart to heart with some of my friends where uh, I think that one of the biggest struggles with the pandemic was the amount of isolation that was involved. You know, I'm very much an extrovert. I started to feel like I was disappearing because I, I love just talking to people in line at the grocery store. I love talking to people all the time. And before I had gone viral, I didn't have this big social media presence. So I wasn't able to just communicate with everybody. Um, so I got very depressed. And I think it's important to recognize like, you know, the, the you know, term clinical depression or the diagnosis and then feelings of depression, because those are sometimes different things that can sometimes feel very similar. Um, and having an understanding of mental health can really give us the tools and the language to navigate those things. Um, when I had that talk with some of my friends earlier today, we were talking about how they They've noticed that I haven't been as, you know, as social. And I think that what missed what was hard in, during the pandemic was that nobody was able to really check on you like that. You're seeing the same people in your household if you live with anybody, the same over and over again. So it's not really uh, as easy as having your friends who you might act a certain way at home and a certain way with your friends, but not having that external component to check in with you is difficult. I'm so grateful that my friends checked in on me um, and I feel much better. They're basically like Blair. You need to be doing these things like, you know, we won't we don't want to call you out. You, we don't want to make you feel vulnerable, but like you can't be superwoman. You need to ask for help. And so I think that the pandemic has uh, made, made it really difficult. But I think what a lot of people did during the pandemic and hopefully folks talk about this as well was figure out their own mental health. We had to deal with ourselves. We had to deal with, you know, who we are in private. Uh, and if it wasn't something that we liked, then maybe figure out what transformations we have to make to become that person that we do like, that we do want to be in community with, even if it's just ourselves. Thank you so much for that, Blair. Um, Seed Lali, I saw you nod. Can I ask you to build on that? Yes, of course. So hi, my name is Seed Lali Kurincita. I'm from the Bay Area in California, and I attend middle college at Cañado College. Um, I definitely feel that the pandemic has affected and impacted me um, with my mental health, um, actually negatively and positively. Um, so I've always had a hard time getting out of my comfort zone as a child in my childhood. Um, but the pandemic definitely made it more anxiety provoking just to reach out for opportunities to grow or make mistakes, right? And mistakes are needed <laughs> during, a, like during our lives. So, um, some ways that I dealt with this was, um, as hard as it, as hard as it sounds, I participated virtually during school activities and academic activities. I set up these little goals for myself, um, answer questions, answer a question one time a day or one time a Zoom meeting. And um, eventually it, gro it growed from that, from that on. Um, but it wasn't easy just finding a way um, to grow during the pandemic, <laughs> as I mentioned previously. So I found clubs, um, for example, I joined the social justice club during um, the online virtual aspect of this pandemic and it really helped me they inspired me to make my own club just to um gather folks to talk about what's going on in the world and that's what i mean how um sorry let me gather my thoughts um uh, by that i feel like the pandemic affected me and impacted me positively because i got the opportunity um to actually make a statement and say that I got your back, you know, and others have your back. Um, so I feel like we all need a space. <laughs> we all needed that space in the pandemic to actually relax with others. So that's how the pandemic affected or impacted me. I heard that you're like really pushed out of your comfort zone by the events of the last couple of years. Layla, I wonder if that's something that you experienced as well kind of being pushed into new places by the circumstances. Um, hi, my name is Layla Cunningham and I'm from PG County, Maryland. Um, and yes, I was actually pushed out of my comfort zone. So during the pandemic, I wasn't really going out more like Blair said, she said she was more introverted and I'm a very extroverted person. So I felt as if I was like out from my friends, like outcasted. I more so felt like I was stuck in the house because my dad wouldn't let me leave, you know, can't leave pandemic. So I felt more so like I was left out of everything and stuff. So I feel like that negatively affected my mental health because I felt like I was alone.
And it was like the worst feeling in the world, being able to see all your friends still going out and you're stuck in the house. But it also positively impacted me because I realized who my friends are. And it made me realize, gave myself a self-awareness, meaning I don't really need people to feel myself. You know what I mean? And then over time, I realized I still had friends that would be my friend, no matter if I was able to go out with them all the time or not. And I feel like that made me become more of who I was supposed to be. For sure. And I think we can all resonate with that sort of feeling of loneliness, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, where, I mean, a lot of us were cut off in the lives we were used to living. Um, Eddie, you, do you want to build on that and reflect on, on that feeling as you experienced it over the last couple of years? Sure. Um, hi, my name's Eddie. Um, I think I more so relate to um, what Blair said, because when I, um, during quarantine, personally, I was just, I was like alone with all my thoughts. Like there was no one else in the household that I could like, like usually I would be expressive with my thoughts, like with my friends and stuff. But due to quarantine, I was just stuck with my own talk with my sorry, with my own thoughts. And I had I, like I, I had nowhere else to go with that. And I feel like that negatively impacted my mental health because it's it's not fun being and it's not fun being alone with your thoughts, especially if they're negative thoughts. So that was one of the hardest parts for me. And like Layla said, I in a way, quarantine made me realize who my real friends were because like, of course, like, I didn't drive, like, my parents weren't letting me go out, and staying in contact with those friends, like, even if it was through text or, like, FaceTime, like, it, it was really beneficial to see who I could depend on in, you know, like, hard times like these. No doubt, and Britton, you want to round us out on this kind of broad reflection, the last two years, uh, and your emotional journey. Hi, everyone, my name is Britton Benjamin Kelly, I'm from Cass Technical High School in Detroit, Michigan. Um, when quarantine started, it was actually pretty nice for me, um, because for my school, we, um, we just kind of stopped school altogether. So I had like an extra long summer break but with that extra long summer break, I kind of lost all type of structure. So when school started again, it felt like there was no clear separation between work and home because we were doing fully online. And after going from going to school every day to only leaving my house to take walks by myself, it was a huge transition. And while doing online school for a full year, it felt like I had to just do work all day or I just couldn't do anything at all. It was really stressful and confusing, and it was something that was really hard to adjust to. I can be really extroverted, so being in the house all the time kind of made me lose my mind, and it felt like my life was going nowhere, which was really hard to deal with. I used to like hanging out with my friends and going to academic games tournaments, but I couldn't do that stuff anymore. So it was partially a self-discovery process because I had to figure out what I like to do on my own, but it was still a hard journey to have to go through by myself. Yeah, that is that is so real. And I feel like I'm hearing a theme of the pandemic um, really forcing folks to take like a deep look inside of what's going on with them emotionally. Now, in my reporting, I've heard sort of over and over again that folks uh, often need support to do that. Like asking those hard questions, what's going on deep inside? Like it's hard to do that alone, um, especially in the middle of a pandemic. So I wanted to ask folks like what supports they had, um, especially in school, um, in terms of people who, who, who might've been able to talk with them about what was going on emotionally and help them make that leap towards, towards understanding and, and growth. Um, uh, Seed Lali, do you want to kick us off? Sure, let's go for it. So um, my support systems during the pandemic was definitely, <laughs> to pitch it in, college track. <laughs> they gave me the opportunity to make this social justice club and um, collab it with our therapists there at college track. And we, they, they listened to us. They listened to what the students needed. And I was very grateful to have that support system that not only will help me, but so many others at college track in our East Palo Alto Center. Um, so it was definitely college track, but it was it was a little bit difficult because I feel like many students during the online um, world, even myself, um, when everything went virtual, we got disconnected from everything in life. So many didn't attend. We saw some classmates leave. We saw some um, lose motivation, right? But I feel like college track gave us the opportunity, the staff members, 
to, I guess, pull us back into reality in, in a way. Um, so it was definitely my college track family. <laughs> totally. Okay. So caring adults in your lives, kind of hearing your problems, helping you move forward. Um, Britton, who were those folks for you? Or, or maybe who, who, who uh, could you have used at school um, to, to try to process what was going on? Mm, no one, literally no one comes to mind. Um, even with my peers, it kind of felt like no one really understood what I was going through. A lot of my peers were thriving in school and I was struggling a lot. Um, and my teachers, well, I guess my teachers were um, lenient um, when it came to like turning in assignments and such. And that was definitely helpful. But when it came to like my mental health and processing what I was going through, I didn't really have much support there. I want to chime in on that. I've definitely felt similarly, uh, Britton. I was talking to my dad recently. He went to his 50th uh, college reunion. For, you know, he's 72. And he was talking about all the things he's going through. And I have my 10-year reunion for high school. And I was telling my dad, like, well, I don't know if I would go. I didn't really have friends in school. And he was like, surely there was somebody. And just like you started with, that's why I kind of like smiled to myself, even though it's not great news that there was nobody, because that's how I felt. And it can be really tough. But I think, you know, I have this desire to put a silver lining on everything. But I think it can be a gift to learn how to be your own supporter and how to be there for yourself. Um, you know, like being able to find solidarity in who you are. Yes, it's a difficult time. Yes, you should have had support, but don't let the fact that you didn't really hold you back from being that person for other people. That's what I try to do at least. Like now I'm trying to be, the t well, I've always been trying to be the type of person where like, even if I didn't have a lot of friends or I didn't have a support system, if I see somebody who does need that support, I try to make myself available, especially because I've gone through that experience, but it is difficult. And I think the best thing to do is to be honest about it. What was the reality? And remember what maybe you deserve to have and then try to figure out how you can bridge those gaps, the world that you deserve and the world that we have and how we can do that together. Um, I'm gonna popcorn it over to Layla. I would say my support system, I would like to piggyback off of Seat Lottie, right? Is that how you pronounce it? Okay, I'm sorry if I butchered it. Um, College Track was actually a really big support system as well as my mother. Um, she was there, she's like my best friend. She, oh, like when I couldn't go out with my friends, I was always downstairs with her and we'd be watching TV shows and doing things that I would do with my friends. But also College Trek, they really sat here and did these workshops with us and provided Zoom meetings with us over the pandemic, which really like, how would I say, helped us reconnect with the people that we couldn't really connect with in school. And like she also said, I have seen a lot of my friends nowadays that aren't like really going to college anymore or aren't doing all these other things that aren't in College Trek. And I see a lot of the people who are and who had those support systems still motivated to go to college and to do a little bit better, <laughs> we would say, in like when it comes to their after school plans. And so I feel like them having a way to connect with us throughout the pandemic and to make us feel like we're not alone with what we do is a really big part of, of I think, where I am at least today. For sure. Um, so, Elizabeth. I wonder if I could like turn you towards like school staff. I mean, it's something we've looked at a lot. It's like the idea of school counselors, school therapists. Was there anybody actually at the school level who was available to help you through this time? Um, well, first, hello, everybody. My name is Cesar Martinez. Um, I'm in Los Angeles, California, and I go to join high school. Um, actually, throughout the two years, there was one teacher. Um, he was my creative writing and film teacher. And well, the students really love him because he is, he's, he's a, like, he acts real well. He's a, obviously he's a real person, but like he won't hide anything. And so because of that, he was very like authentic. Oh, yeah. And it was actually during Zoom meetings um, during class. Instead of actually doing work, he would just tell us like, okay, I know it's a difficult time for you guys. So I will provide this space to like say anything you want. So he provided the kids with like a space to either rant about their lives, anything. And the kids actually took the opportunity and well, so did I. And it was just like a very good space because I feel comfortable. And so that helped me as well with my mental health since I was able to like share my problems, share what was going on. So it was like an outlet. Um, 
And yet, actually, to this day, like I will sometimes go to him, like in case I'm struggling or anything. And he, I know he will be there as a resource for me. It's really awesome, Elizabeth. I want to jump in to talk about um, a mentor I had like that. Also, I see you have a Lisa Congdon uh, poster. She's a friend of mine. She, oh my goodness, the one with the tiger. I'm friends with the artist. Um, but so my mentor was Mr. Walker and he was so cool. I took his class three times in high school. Um, I had finished a lot of my classes early, but then my senior year, I still had to do stuff. So I just took his class again and he kept changing it. And it was really cool. Cause like, even though I didn't have a lot of friends, I like still felt like he cared. Like I was dating somebody who wasn't the best you know, relationship and he didn't want to push too much, you know, way too nosy, but he was still kind of like, hey, what's going on? And I think it's a good reminder that sometimes we don't have to give people the best advice. We don't have to give people guidance. We don't have to give people solutions. We just have to give them space for a, a safe discussion about what's bothering them because sometimes that can be a solution too. Definitely. And I, I love the description, Elizabeth, of that kind of open sharing space that was so healing for you. Eddie, was there any space like that for you at school um, where you felt like folks could could really process what was going on? Um, not really at school, but as mentioned again, I feel like College Track was one of my biggest support systems because school school is really stressful and the teachers the teachers already had like a lot on their plate and stuff. But I feel like College Track, um, everything being online, they provided us with so many workshops that were beneficial. And after school, like after a long day on Zoom, yeah, we have to go on Zoom again to go to college track. But I feel like it was more beneficial because we weren't doing work. Like we were actually focusing on mental health and we were sharing, you know, like we were basically ranting, like Elizabeth said, um, our feelings to like a big group of people who would understand what we're going through because they're going through the same thing as well. So I feel like with school, no, but college track was a big support system. And I think before we go to the next question, I love what you said, Eddie, like even when you're expressing like maybe some frustrations that things could have been better, you're still acknowledging that the teachers had a lot on their plate. I think that that's a great way to live, to be like what uh, Britain really liked about what I said, the world we have versus the world we deserve. And recognizing like sometimes the shortcomings that people have aren't their own fault, it's the system that we're in. And it's not about being resentful or angry at those folks, but instead like you know, recognizing what they were going through and what you were going through, and then also being happy that you had that that situation to shift it. But I'm so glad that those spaces existed because I think a lot of folks, you know, I wasn't in school during uh, during the beginning of the pandemic, but I almost wish that I was because I feel like everybody around me on social media was acting like this is fine or just on vacation, and my savings were going away, and I was stressed out, and I wasn't sure we were going to get toilet paper, but I didn't feel like people were being realistic about those things, and I think that can be a struggle for mental health too just talking about how the sort of the, the limits of asking teachers and school systems that are stretched really thin to, to support us kind of brings me to the opportunity that we, that we have right now to be framing the conversation about student mental health. Like, what are the things that um, school leaders, that uh, teachers, that students should be thinking about as we uh, you know, discuss it and, and learn more about sort of this critical issue and see so many students struggling, especially in the wake of the pandemic. I wonder if I could ask folks to talk about like what conversations they would want to see about student mental health right now. Um, uh, maybe starting with you, Elizabeth. The topic, I guess, will be um, like talking more to adults. Because um, for me specifically, I have like some trouble talking with adults. And um, so obviously, like having a conversation of like how to like navigate that as well as um like talking about my emotions as well since sometimes I will hide them um so I feel like if there's a topic of that I guess I will like learn more from that and use those strategies like for more in my life as well for sure for sure I'm see Lali you want to build on that yeah so some student wellness conversations I would like to see happen is us having the space to talk about what is vulnerability and how do we address vulnerability? Um, and what are some spaces where we could provide to be vulnerable? <laughs> so I feel like vulnerability for me is super hard to talk about and it can be very uncomfortable for many, most definitely. Um, but in most cases, I feel like there is a need to be vulnerable, to feel fully heard and understood. Um, and I feel like as Lisbeth said, um, 
it tends us it tends for us to keep our emotions inside if we don't have that space to be vulnerable and that could cause and that could build up to a mental breakdown or something worse um and i feel like we could definitely feel that sense of being suffocated um and i think it's important for many to know that being vulnerable is okay and it and it should be normal um and it should be embraced li literally anywhere we go um, so that's something that I feel like that needs to be more discussed. No doubt. <laughs> I see Blair's giving some snaps. Blair, Blair you want to add to that? <laughs> oh, yeah. I just think that's that's such an important point. Like, um, as you were suggesting those things, I'm thinking about, yes, like a discussion on how to have, like, how do we discuss our feelings? How do we be vulnerable? Um, when it comes to vulnerability, like I think for a long time, I was like, oh, don't ever cry in public. People will think you're weak. Well, why are people thinking I'm weak if I'm crying? Like if I'm crying, it might indicate that, yeah, my feelings were hurt. And if I'm showing that, that's not a personal failure. That's actually healthy. Like when we cry, it releases chemicals in our brain to nurture us and to comfort us. The only thing you need to do when you cry is to drink water to rehydrate yourself. Like you don't need to be embarrassed of having feelings. And so I think people don't learn how to do that. And maybe like, I think I'm, I'll probably do a smarter in seconds on like vulnerability. What is it, how to express it and how it's not a bad thing. Like just because you're showing your feelings doesn't mean you're weak. For sure. Britain, so spaces for vulnerability, um, for crying, uh, people are wanting that and anything else you'd like to see added uh, in our, to our conversation about student mental health? I feel like um, also when it comes to vulnerability, we have to make sure that we're not judging other people or trying to solve people's problems for them. Some people just want someone to listen to them and be like, yeah, I totally understand what you're going through. Or just be like, yeah, I hear you. I've never been through that before, but you know, I really hope it gets better for you. Um, I feel like people forget to mention that part sometimes. No doubt. Layla, your thoughts? I would love for people to start talking about giving more mental health days for students because we work so incredibly hard to get to where we want to be and I feel like they don't give us that like the breaks that we need to all they do is add up attendances add up tardies and penalize us for it but really we just need a break our brains are always working to be better for ourselves be better for our parents to try to make it but we never take the time to really do stuff for ourselves like we have to do work to stay on a team or like to do something that we love extracurriculars. We have to keep our grades up to do these things that we don't really get the chance to enjoy it. Like we have homework that we have to do after school and we don't get the time to do things for ourselves and take time for ourselves. And I feel like we should have that time because as children, we're only kids. We have the rest of our adult lives that we have to work and we probably won't have that time for ourselves. So I feel like as children, we should make the most of what we have before that time comes and it would be better for our mental health. Yeah, I feel like, um, as Layla mentioned briefly, um, schools would be a big help because they don't really, well, especially during online, I don't feel like my teachers cared that much. Well, I don't wanna assume, but it seemed like not that many teachers were really involved in their students' mental health. And it's kind of understandable because yeah, we're at, like we're doing Zoom because we can't go in person and school is supposed to be school, but I feel like, the counselors, for personal experience, I reached out to my counselors plenty of times and I, throughout the whole school year, I got no reply. So that shows a lot about the school. Um, and with certain teachers, I feel like if I were to reach out, like it is, and it was hard reaching out, but I feel like if I were, like there would be those, you know, like one-on-one -on -one meetings that we can have, but I don't think there could have been anything that would, that could have been done like as a whole class together because the teachers have the mindset we're at school we're here to learn you know like and even if we did have the mental health time it wouldn't be like a class period or like half the class period but i feel like that would have been really beneficial for a lot of students can i add something to that if possible oh yeah go for it i also like want to piggyback again off of what eddie was saying I feel like teachers, especially when we were on Zoom, they just kept giving us work after work after work. And I feel like they assumed that when we're at home, we don't have like that we're just chilling and relaxing all day. But I feel like teachers don't understand that we have some people have 
eight to 10 other classes other than theirs. And they're assigning us four to five assignments per class period. And then we're sitting here up late each night, tired out of our minds, having to wake up the next day and do it all over again. And they don't realize that we have other stuff we have to do. Plus, while we're at home, we have chores and we have all this other stuff that our parents are asking of us because we're home all day. And they probably think we're just laying down all day, too. So it's like there's work after work and it's just building up. And we just keep having to wake up and stay up late to just do it every single day. And I feel like that really affects our mental health, too, because it feels like we're just nonstop working and we have no time to, like, take a breath and just relax. I just wanted to add that um, even if we are at home doing nothing, I feel like we deserve to be at home doing nothing um, after being in school all day for eight hours. Because why is my entire life school? I'm not I was not born a student. I was born a person. You know, I have interests, I have hobbies, I have friends, I have family. I deserve to live my life outside of school. And like Layla said, we have all these other responsibilities that we need to take care of. And I don't know, I just feel like a lot of people don't really consider that. We're having a pause break, a very genuine pause break. This is so, this is so key. There's a lot of the conversations that folks are having, I think, uh, Kobe might be closer to my age range, like where but folks are having because it's really frustrating, like, you know, taking a nap and then it's like, well, no, it's okay. You're napping so you can be more productive later. What if I'm just napping to nap? What if I just rest? And this whole idea of like being productive, being the only way that you are, you know, worthy in society, it goes to capitalism. It can go a lot to racism and sexism and it's really exhausting. Um, the good thing that I will say, I think Layla, you said like, but we have to get our time in now to relax before we get older. One of the things that was so exciting about finishing college was not having homework all the time and like going to work and then going home. And now I'm my own boss. So I have to really build in that work life balance. I have, um, I have my work phone now and I have my like uh, life phone. So I made that change recently. But I think learning those balance habits are really important because what sometimes happens is that students who are under a lot of pressure, like what y'all have described and written what you so well like articulated, which was that, you know, you weren't born a student. I'm going to start saying that. I wasn't born a worker. I was born a person. Um, and it being that like, yes, we're here to grow. We're here to learn. But at the end of the day, we're people and we don't deserve to have to toil our whole lives. That's not sustainable. That's not realistic. That's not, uh, that's not what we were meant to do. Absolutely. And, you know, just speaking for myself, it did get a little harder when everything was on the computer, you know, at school, you actually have passing time, you know, you have lunch time. there's all these breaks built in when you're in physical in, in person. Um, and it can be harder in virtual, as I'm hearing people say. Um, so I feel like folks started to like jump in on the question of supports that schools could provide. I wanted to just to dig in a little more there. Um, Elizabeth, from your perspective, is there anything more that, that your school could do? to support uh, students' mental health? Well, I do believe it would be great if like one day of the month, we just like no class. Like we, we go to school, but like we can like say, we'll watch movies, play games at least once a day, like once once a month. Um, actually, I've been hearing kids say that. So it's not anything new. I feel like if we have that time, um, we can like take a break, mental break, rest, and still hang out with our, with our friends. As well as see our teachers as well, since um, it's nice to see our teacher like not working and and have them like talking to the students, like having one on ones, um, just being completely like enjoying the moment. Um, I feel like if my school were to do that, um, I'll be more happier going to school because I will look forward to those days and I feel like I would like work hard to do that. Um, yeah, I feel like my school should have that. See, Lali, how about you? How, how can your school better support students' mental health? Go. All right. So I feel like um, I, I don't know if any of you all deal with it, but I get so much anxiety when I have to take a test, exam, midterm, final, however you want to call it. Um, anything of that sort, I get super, I get so, like, I just get so nervous that I can't think properly. And I don't know if you all deal with this, but once you go in the classroom, the teacher has that piece of paper right in front of you, whatever it is, a blue book, um, just a multiple choice answer test. There's no time to sit down, take a breather, drink some water. It's just ready, go, you know? And, and literally, um, 
what Britain said. We weren't born to be a student. We were born to be, you know, a, a human, right? And there's no opportunity for that. And we need to see, we need to see more, let's see, how do I say this? If every classroom could have a period of time, let's say five minutes, to just breathe all together, drink water all together, and just, just enjoy our presence <laughs> before we take a huge exam, I feel like that would make a difference. Um, literally, a sip of water can make a difference um, when you feel really anxious. So we need to see that. Wow, I feel like it kind of starts with the teachers. Um... I feel like when teachers start taking care of their own mental health, they'll encourage their students to do so as well. I have um, a teacher who will just not come to school if she's having a bad day, like a, a bad mental health day. Um, and she'll encourage her students to do the same um, because, you know, we should not be forcing ourselves. I mean, we don't force ourselves to come to work if we're like physically sick. So why do we force ourselves to come to work when we're not feeling well mentally? You know, I feel like we have to treat mental health and physical health as the same thing because they both affect our lives. Snap from Blair. I feel like I feel like Blair, like we've got a bunch of student future influencers right here. <laughs> I just I think that y'all understand y'all have a better like class analysis of rest and capitalism and like systemic understandings than a lot of folks that I work with on a regular basis, which makes me really excited because I think having those understandings is so key, like for the, the solution you mentioned, Britain, to be like, well, let's start with the teachers. That might sound counterintuitive to talk about student mental health, but if the people who are in charge of like shaping young minds are not in a place where they can take care of themselves, then it's going to be difficult for them to implement any practice. So that means increasing student pay, I mean, teacher pay, that means increasing, you know, mental health services and making that a systemic thing, which will show a culture shift. So this is, this is fantastic. So Eddie, like we're now sort of steering, uh, seemingly in the direction of the end of the pandemic, certainly another another moment. Uh, how do you envision your school moving forward, the education system moving forward in supporting student mental health? I feel like since we're back in, I guess, normal school, since we're back in person, I feel like there could be a lot more that could be done, like knowing what's, you know, like what's happened to mental health over quarantine. Um, but I feel like, I don't know who mentioned this, but even if it is in person, just having like that five minutes or even 15 minutes of just, hey, like I know we're stressed or like, especially during finals week, because finals week, like they be getting to everyone, but like just that like 15 minutes or like 10 minutes of class, like, hey, everyone, I know you're pit, sorry, not pissed. Um, <laughs> I know you're stressed and stuff, but like, let's take like a short period of time to just do some breathing, drink some water, take walks, like just any of those, you know, I guess activities that can help us, you know, like kind of debrief. Um, clubs, there. I feel like since we're in, per I, online was the problem. Personally, I feel like online was the thing that bought mental health kind of like lower than it already was. So in person, just, you know, being more involved, making students, be more involved, making students be comfortable, and just things like that. For sure. Layla, how about you, your, your vision uh, as, as we move forward here? Two things, actually. I would hope that one day they make lunch longer than 30 minutes. I don't know if all schools are like that, but I'm not going to lie, I eat a lot, and I just need a, just a little longer of a break, like at least an hour, maybe an hour and 30, like class is the same amount of time, so you should give us that amount of time as a break. And the other thing is, I feel like schools should be more career focused. I feel like they waste our time and their time teaching a bunch of stuff that we're probably not going to use or need. And that's taking up a lot of our brain space and our brain power and giving us a bunch of homework on it. And we're not going to use it. I feel like we should be able to take classes or use stuff and do stuff that's more focused on what we want to become or that's going to help us future, like in the future, like cursive writing, they should bring that back or how to learn about taxes and insurance and down payments and stuff like that. I feel like we should get more classes that really focus on what we need rather than taking up our mental space with stuff that we don't. 
Another key point to talk about systemic issues, I think, which Lally was talking about as well, is how intentional that is, like how much uh, it would improve society if people had lessons about taxes, like, or even just like inclusive sex education, like a lot of these things are omitted by on, on purpose. And so knowing that they're not there and like fortifying those things are really important. It's again, that light, that world that we have and then the world that we deserve. Okay, Elizabeth, uh, talking about the world that we deserve and kind of where, where we're headed um, with schools and mental health. Any final words from you? I also agree with what Lila was saying about like bringing in more of those type of classes. Um, actually, my when my brother, when he would talk about his high school experience, he would talk about oh, how he, he would have, um, like, was it home ec, something like that? They would teach him like how to cook. Um, I really wish I had that class because I feel like if I, had, if I had a class that would teach me how to cook, like use a knife properly, then I will be more prepared as an adult since I will actually need that um, compared to like oh, all these different like math classes that I will, I, I can say I'm not, I am not going to use that. Um, as well as like, the, like classes of a different form of arts as well, like crafting, um, wood workshops, all of that. Um, I feel like if students had that type of class, then they won't like, they can rest their minds a bit since they're like, it's more of a hands-on experience. And I feel like they will like take in more, it'll be more value to them um, compared to like, like core, core classes that, yes, it is important, but I think I feel like it's also important to do something that we will like. Um, so I hope in the future, like, like schools can start incorporating that standard. Um, but like so far it hasn't, but that's kind of my wish for the future. Totally. Seat Lolly. This is myself being a little bit futuristic, but hopefully there is more opportunity to have spaces, let's say, in between school, not during lunch, not during a break, where we could just sit down and relax. <laughs> I feel like it's a good opportunity to have a certain, let's say, a period of, I don't want to call it a class, but it should be like a class. It should be like any math class or, or science class. It should just be a period of time during school where we can talk to others about what's going on in life, how are we feeling about college applications, um, and I feel like, let's see, <laughs> yeah, just like a regular class period of just relaxation and not just not doing anything, but expressing how we feel. Um, yeah, well, how class period like? of processing. It reminds me yeah. of Elizabeth's story about the film class where everyone was like making space to have the emotional conversation that they needed about the pandemic. That's deep, that is deep. Britain, um, do you want to share your vision for, for what's next for school-based mental health? Yeah, um, we could start with um, letting people take breaks. I mean, we've been talking about that the whole time. Like, people just deserve a break from time to time. Um, and people deserve to be understood as well. Um, we should have, like, I don't know, a little support group or something. Like, yo, life is hard. Yeah, it really is. You know, a little support group in school and stuff. Or like a place where students can just leave class and go sit down for a second and gather their thoughts or take a nap or something. Like literally just a space for people to take a break. I guess that's our first step. We need to take more breaks. So often I work with so many different companies. Um, I've consulted with like Meta and all these different, you know, a bunch of things. And what what I often tell these different, even governments um, to do is listen to the people that are most directly affected. And I wish that was more common. So often you'll have school districts or school boards that spend a bunch of money on hiring consultants to tell you what a group of students could tell you. And so I wish there was a mechanism where school districts and school boards and superintendents would just be like, hmm, what do the students need? Let's ask the students instead of infantilizing you all and saying, well, they're kids, they don't understand. It's like, well, they're simultaneously kids and also understand what they're going through and have solutions. Um, and so I think that's something to fight for as well is really just having the people who have the direct experience be the ones to dictate the solutions. Um, but I do think that the world is moving toward that, not fast enough though. 
Well, thank you so, so much to our student panelists for raising their voices today um, and to Blair Mani uh, for bringing us home. Um, we're going to turn it over now to a panel of mental health experts to discuss uh, the, the policy side of student mental health. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Darville, and I'm the managing editor for National News here at Chalkbeat. Um, our reporters have been following this topic all year from Newark to Chicago to Denver and beyond as schools take on a bigger role in student mental health. We've reported on schools adding counselors, opening clinics, and incorporating lessons meant to help students deal with stress and anxiety. And we've also seen the ways that the need still really outstrips those offerings. Schools can't always fill those new roles. The pandemic is continuing to disrupt students' lives, and schools are often unequipped to handle students in crisis. Um, and so for many students, the grief and uncertainty of the pandemic are layering on top of existing trauma. Um, I'm, I'm excited to have a little time with such a thoughtful group um, today to talk a little bit more about where things stand. Um, our panelists today include Dr. Dave Anderson, a clinical psychologist and the vice president of school and community programs at the Child Mind Institute, which works with over a thousand schools in New York and California. Uh, Dr. Laura Clary, a faculty member at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, with a focus on child and adolescent social emotional development and mental health. Uh, principal Leando Dunn, the principal of Mastery Simon Gratz High School in Philadelphia, where he's been an administrator for five years. Dr. Jessica Jackson is a licensed psychologist and a subject matter expert for the ACOMA Project, a nonprofit focused on the mental health needs of young people of color. And Dr. Mitch Princeton, the Chief Science Officer of the American Psychological Association and a professor of psychology and neuroscience at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I do okay? All right. Dr. Princeton, I wonder if you could start us off by setting the scene a little bit. I feel like the pandemic has shined a new and more intense light on um, some of these issues, but I think one of the things that's been um, surprising and upsetting from a, from a reporting standpoint has been realizing how so many of these trends were, you know, seeing kind of alarming um, developments in the decade before the pandemic hit, you know, around depression, anxiety, suicide. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what those longer trends look like, what you make of them, and, you know, maybe what, um, you know, why didn't this get more attention before the pandemic um, arrived? I'm not sure why it didn't get more attention before, but I wish, I sure wish that it did, because as you say, it, it has been a, a huge issue for many, many years. In fact, if you look at the leading causes of death over the past 50 years or so, you can see that for almost everything, you see these tremendous decreases in the proportion of people who are dying by cardiovascular disease, by accidents, but with one exception, and that is suicide. Over the last 50 years, we're seeing a doubling in the percentage of people who are dying by suicide. And particularly for youth, it's the second leading cause of death. And it's been that way for a very long time. So this has just you know, been decades of neglect towards emotional, behavioral, mental health. And um, like so many things, the pandemic really exposed a problem that was there for long time and made us see it all in a very different and more disturbing light. Um, did anyone else want to chime in on on that or, or what in particular you've been paying attention to as the, um, you know, as we're seeing um, schools and families grapple with this issue right now? I'll just add real quickly that um, in addition to um, uh, the idea that the that the, pandemic, that the pandemic has really exposed these problems that were already in existence before. It also um, has exposed the sort of racial inequalities and how structural racism has really um, disproportionately affected um, under-resourced communities. So I think, unfortunately, it has caused the disparities to, to, even, to widen even further. So I just wanted to add that little piece. Thanks for that. Um, Principal Dunn, I'd love for you to take us into, into the school level. Um, and, you know, I know for 
many schools, the idea that they have an important role to play in helping students handle trauma is not new. This is something that has been a part of the way that you think about school and education for a very long time. And I know your school in particular has experienced far more than its share of grief over the past year, especially as a result of gun violence. Um, and so I'd love to hear a little bit from you about just how you're thinking about the particular mental health needs of your students and staff um, this year, and maybe some of what you've been able to do in response. Yeah, thank you for that question. So first off, I'll start by saying that there's often this misconception with students, um, particularly students who live in um, urban centers around, I just want kids to walk into the classroom. I want them to sit down at a desk, pick up the pen and begin engaging with learning and instruction, which that's a great concept. And I, I wish it was that easy. Um, but I think what's often missed is that if a student or if a person's individual basic needs are not being met, it's incredibly difficult for them to walk into a space and be able to jump in with that instruction. I think prior to the pandemic, um, there, while, while numbers have been growing and while I don't think this issue that we're talking about has been getting enough attention, I think there was this playbook that educators across the country could follow. When something in the building happens, you do X. I think with the pandemic and the fact that we went virtual, we came back into the building, students and staff were lacking consistency. Young people need consistency for multiple different reasons. And whether that's community and building relationships, whether that's access to warm, fresh, healthy meals, um, whether that's having someone to confide into, um, students haven't had that consistency. Um, and when you, when you overlay that with the pandemic um, and you see on social media that a young person is having suicidal ideations, what do you now as an educator do when you're realizing this at nine o'clock? I'll also say that for school teams um, and administrators and particularly in Philadelphia, what we are seeing when we wanna jump in and get a young person access to support is that the system is incredibly overworked. Um, and so we may make a phone call and we're asking to have a young person evaluated. Um, and we may not get a call back or we may not actually get that young person evaluated um, five, six, seven hours later. And so when I talk about that playbook, um, there's not a book that exists that tells you when you can't get a young person access to the critical care that they need, here's what you do for the next six hours while you try to figure out, while you try to call the next place and the next place until you can find a place that has a spot. And so I think for, for school teams, we've just been in this space where the work is ever changing, the needs are ever growing, and a lot of the responsibility rests on us in terms of like figuring out how to get access to support for young people. And I'll also say the support that young people need, um, it comes in many different forms. And when you think about educators in classrooms who are formally trained educators, and they're having to support students who are having mental health issues, they're having to support students who are navigating food insecurity, they're having to support students who are dealing with the trauma of the reoccurrent and frequent gun violence in the community. It's both a lot for the young people to navigate. It's also a lot for young, for adults um, who are supporting young people in those spaces. Dr. Anderson, I know you're, you, the, the Child Mind Institute, you're working directly with schools on some of this, um, you know, support and skill building. Like how are you seeing those playbooks change and, and what still needs to, to happen to be getting more students what they need? I mean, you know, I, I'm trying to kind of appreciate mindfully what Leon was saying about, you know, the needs here. It's, you know, something where I think what we're looking at is, is you know, our, our work at Child Mind is both on, on one level kind of around public health messaging and on another around serving the most high need communities in New York and in California around our offices and then in select places across the country. And on a public level, we're fighting to make sure the messaging is making sense as to what the real drivers of this crisis might be in the sense that, you know, there, there's, there's too much in the way of wanting to put it on boogeymen, like for example, social media, which to be sure has an accelerating effect for certain vulnerable populations in terms of mental health issues and too little effort put on the nuances of the systemic issues that Laura and Leando are highlighting. So it's this sense of like, if we could just get, you know, Instagram to pay attention, we'd fix this. And that's, that's not really the narrative. The narrative is more of what well, I was talking about, where if, if there's a kid who's in need of emergency care, or even a kid who's not in need of emergency care, is in need of 
uh, you know, just regular care, uh, three months of evidence-based practice to address trauma. You know, one of the things I, I thought about with regard to kind of what we're discussing about kids who are, you know, witnesses to gun violence is that, you know, one of the reasons our program deliver trauma treatment directly in schools where kids are for free, you know, uh, in, in New York and San Francisco, and why we train school-based mental health professionals anywhere to do that um, is because, you know, for a kid who's been witness to that in, in most of the, the communities we serve, in particular in some of the communities that Laura was talking about where the, the disparities are widening, um, it's an eight-month wait list for a treatment that isn't even targeted to the trauma. And there's these incredible gaps um, that we're trying to figure out how we fix, you know, I think this is what our work is, is, is how we can equip communities to be able to have the resources they need regardless of infrastructure. That we're not sitting there saying, well, you've got to wait until, you know, your mayor or your congressperson or your superintendent gives you the funding for this, but rather, you know, here's what you can do with the people who are on the ground who want to help, but also, you know, are completely overwhelmed right now to the point about kind of the playbook ever changing. I'm sorry, that was a lot, all once. No, that was that was great. Uh, Dr. Jackson, was there more you wanted to add about that? I mean, we've been talking about this, the sort of infrastructure failures here and the, the particular, you know, mental health infrastructure that students of color are, are navigating and the ways that that is, is not working right now. Absolutely. Um, I, there's like two parts. So I think systemically for youth, for children in general, I think one of the things we don't talk about enough is the community mental health system was not built for youth and children. It was built for adults. And we've been able to, to kind of not see it as much um, because of the school system. So when kids were no longer in school, then everyone was like, where do we send them? Because historically we'll say they can see their school counselor and there's nothing like a well-resourced school therapist, right? They already know where to go in the community. They have a list, they know who to refer out to. But when they're not getting to see those youth on a day to day, the average parent, for example, cannot take their child to a community mental health clinic and there's someone there to see them. Or when I've worked on inpatient units, parents don't know that you have to go to a children's hospital most of the time for that youth to be on the inpatient. If you go to your regular emergency room, everyone on that inpatient unit is like, what do we do with this 15 year old? Like they can't be on our unit because it wasn't created for that. And so I think the pandemic exacerbated how much of our system is not available to support youth. Um, and then I think for our students of color, it became even harder because there were things that they were navigating in addition to the pandemic, the health disparities that existed meant that there were more of them who were losing parents or caretakers. And then when we had the murder of George Floyd and you think about how that looked in schools around the country. So even when schools were back in session, maybe what it looked like on the football field when people were saying things, it was something that was coming up for all of these youth. And so they're trying to navigate, not only am I experiencing the health issue and grief, but now I'm also experiencing like, I don't know how people feel about who I am as I identify. So trying to find my place in the world. And then you have to find a, a therapist that really can work with all of those things. So you're really talking about um, having to search hard for somebody with some openings. So I think that is one of the things I wanna highlight. I think if people talk more is as we talk about a mental health crisis and reframe mental health, how do we build in services for youth in the clinics and resources we already have in the community so that we can also then focus on specialization like therapists who can support racial trauma for youth in the community. How do these systems need to change to, to make that happen? Um, uh, Dr. Princeton, is that something that you wanna speak to? Yeah, I mean, I'm so privileged to be on this panel. I, everything that's been said is so, um, is resonating so deeply and, and really rings so true. You know, imagine, imagine a system where all we have are hospitals and people, no one talks about exercise to, you know, help you, you know, stay healthy. No one teaches you how to brush your teeth in school. No one talks about fat or cholesterol. There, there aren't any checkups or anything like that. All we have are people who are so sick that they can't function anymore in their normal work day or school day or home settings, and they get rushed to the hospital. Imagine that that system was what we had for physical health. Imagine that the hospital 
And the treatment that was available was mostly only going to be available for people who are white or who are wealthy. And imagine that it was set up only for adults and they had to figure out how kids could even fit in. That's the mental health system today, essentially. I mean, we would never even imagine such a thing for, for, you know, for behavioral or emotional or mental health. But that is, in fact, exactly what we have. We wait until kids have gotten to the point of such impairment that we are going to sacrifice months or years of their school education. We're going to disrupt their entire family and community until we even provide services at all. You know, and that's not the way it has to be. We could be teaching emotion regulation skills in the 10 minutes after we teach kids how to brush their teeth. We could be screening them for depression and suicide right after we screen them for vision and hearing. You know, we could be having every pediatrician um, examine the stress in the home because stress is something that's going to affect physical health just as much as emotional and mental health. This could all be built in. We would need a workforce to do it. We would need a way to reimburse trained professionals to be able to do it, but we have the science today to do it. And then we would need a system that recognizes that kids don't walk into treatment like an adult does and within 10 minutes say, yeah, I'm depressed, let's start talking about it. When a kid goes into treatment, it's gonna take weeks to assess their teachers and their parents and figure out what is even their diagnosis. And then when we do treatment, we're involving those teachers and those parents and those community members, you know, if we can, to really create a whole system to help that child. But that's not the way that our system is set up. Our system was set up based on a a centuries old notion that physical health and mental health were two separate systems. I think we know enough about the body now and the brain now to know that that's that's just not true. You know, same system, same thing. Um, And also it was set up after World War II when we had a lot of vets coming back and we built the NIMH, we built the VA system, you know, we built a setup for adults and now we've kind of shoehorned kids into that system. So there's a lot being talked about kind of upping the current version of what we have, but the current version of what we have was never sufficient and it's never been enough for kids. And it's promoted disparities, that now we are, we are in a reckoning and realizing that we have been complicit in creating these disparities. So I think we need an overhaul. I'm going to stop going on too long, but, but I want to just paint you the picture of how big a change we need and how many years we have been waiting for that change. Uh, Dr. Clary, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your research, because I, I feel like some of that connects directly into some of those ideas about how to integrate you know, some of those programs into the school day and make them work over the long term? Like, what, what have you learned from, from, from that work that might be helpful for other yeah. educators? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so before the pandemic began, um, I was working with um, a colleague on a trauma-informed um, mental health prevention program in eighth grades in uh, Baltimore City Schools. So we actually, fortunately for, for our program, we had just finished our fourth year. So we used this program over four years in 30 schools with about 600 kids. And um, the program itself, I'll just briefly explain, it's um, a 12 session program. It takes six weeks, 30 minutes um, each time. And um, we trained the mental health counselors in each school to actually deliver this program. But for fidelity reasons for these, for this clinical trial, we had our researchers um, um, who were trained clinicians actually do this, but in conjunction with teachers and and mental health counselors. Um, So what we found, um, well, I'll say first, so as related to COVID, we ended the project, COVID happened, and this natural experiment occurred to us. So, you know, for, you know, we wish COVID wouldn't happen, but since it did, we took the opportunity to recontact the kids who were in this program and just to see how they were doing during COVID. And what we found was that this prevention program, even though some kids hadn't been in it for up to four years, it'd been one to four years since they've been in the program, actually um, their anxiety did not increase over the pandemic. So their anxiety stayed the same from pre-pandemic to 
during and towards, you know, currently. Those who took our active control intervention, which was um, like a health program, um, they did not. They had, they, we saw significantly higher anxiety for those kids. So, you know, it's, and of course, this is only Baltimore City Schools. There, you know, this is a smaller sample, but I mean, I think it really speaks to what we're all talking about here, which is, you know, an ounce of prevention. <laughs> you know, if we had these kinds of programs, which are not particularly intensive, um, you know, in these schools to teach kids how to regulate emotions, how to talk to other kids. Um, you know, there were kids in this intervention program, actually, that were talking about effects that we didn't even think to measure because we didn't think. So when we were doing qualitative interviews afterwards, they were saying things like, well, I feel like I can talk to my parents now. Like, I know how to sort of talk to them. And, and when we have problems, I know how to work them out. I get along better with my siblings because, you know, I stop and think before I go and, you know, get into an argument with them. So those are just some of the examples. But it was really... Um, um, heartening, it's heartening and depressing at the same time because it's heartening because, you know, we can see that this can make a difference, but we really need, um, uh, you know, schools need the resources to be able to do these things. Um, Principal Dunn, uh, I'd love to for you to speak to that last point, the, the resources. Um, I mean, I, I know you have, your school has uh, started a, a pretty um, interesting program to, you know, to kind of wrap around the you know your highest need students um uh but those are those are really resource intensive programs and i wonder kind of where it's for you like how close are you to having what you need to get those programs to like where you'd really want them to be and to be able to sustain them over time yeah i'll say building off of um dr clary's points um and she touched on emotional regulation i'll also say other things that are important are teaching students how to ask for help and who to go to when they need that help, um, teaching young people how to defend a thought or disagree with the thought and be able to walk away. Um, and those are all basic skills that we should be teaching students and should be embedded into all the things, the, the fabric of a normal school day. I think right now um, where my school community is and where many school communities are, is that we're in this, we're, we're professional firefighters. Um, and so every single day, these fires just start popping up all over my building. Um, and I'm fortunate in the sense that I have a team of social workers. So I have six social workers in my building um, and they're phenomenal. And I, I just, I hope they see this and I hope they, they, they see me giving them a shout out for how, how hard they work. Um, but right now, you know, one of the structures that we have in our school building is we have what's called a social work hotline. So any staff member in our building at any point during the day, either when they observe a student behavior that is concerning or when a student has specifically communicated to them, they're able to pick up that phone and a social worker has a phone that's monitored the entire school day and a social worker will respond to that classroom to support the student. Typically throughout the school day, our social workers are spending 80, 90% of their days responding and triaging to these calls. What I wish our social workers had the capacity to do is to do some of the proactive work and hold workshop with students, um, be able to do some ongoing counseling for students that may be navigating certain issues. Um, we, you know, we talked about, uh, Dr. Clary talked about emotional regulation. Um, and in an absence of emotional regulation, what we're seeing in Philadelphia is significantly increased accounts of gun violence, whether students are victims, students are perpetrators, and I think the other thing we have to we have to also bring back to the forefront is that whether or not a student is impacted um, directly by gun violence or directly um, struggling with mental health issues, they're sitting in the same classroom. And so they are friends or they're distant observers and that in and of itself impacts them. But specifically when we're talking about gun violence, young people struggling with emotion regulation, in my school building, um, I got to a point where I didn't want to pull my staff into an auditorium or into our conference room and say, we've lost a young person. And as a principal, I unfortunately got very good at responding to a student tragedy. What I would say to a family, what I would say to students, what I would say to my staff, the supports we offered, where I ordered the flowers from, when we sent counselors out, when we asked for additional counselors to come into our building, I no longer wanted to do that. 
And so we implemented a system. Uh, it's a program at my school. It's called Rebound. And so for our most vulnerable student populations, so students who have already been impacted by gun violence, students who have high absenteeism, students who have previous um, court cases, et cetera, um, those students are, we're working with them to make sure they have a confirmed job or after school program. Those students are receiving cognitive behavioral therapy, some in a one-on-one -on -one setting, some in a group setting. Um, and those students also have access to violence inter interrupters and violence mediators. So when students find themselves in a situation in which they're escalated or it's potentially unsafe, 24 seven, they can call a trusted adult that they've built a relationship with, talk through that issue. In some instances, those trusted adults will go to the location where the students are to pre prevent anything tragic from helping, happening. That program right now in my building is supporting around 65 students. I've got over a thousand students in my building uh, who could all benefit from something similar, uh, but tailored to their individual needs, but it takes resources and it also takes the right people. Um, and so there, there's a very special skill set to be able to answer that phone as a violence mediator, violence interrupter, and to be able to support that young person with making a healthy decision. Everyone can't do that. And so we're also struggling to find and maintain those folks. Um, and if, even if I had the resources, I don't think those people exist at this present time to be able to support my entire building. That's such an important point. Um, uh, Dr. Anderson, it's, it sounded like when, when Principal Dunn started talking about the being professional firefighters, it seemed like that resonated with you. Was there um, something you wanted to, to add, add there? I'm, I'm resonating with pretty much everything that uh, everyone said. I, I think just in terms of additional points to add on, on kind of solutions, because I think that was going back our, our thread here. Um, you know, I think we focus on, on two things, uh, training and supply. So to, to what Principal Dunn, I think, was referring to is that we think a lot about how we bring, uh, you know, things that are easy lifts uh, as easy as possible and getting as much community feedback as we can about the stresses that teachers or school-based mental health professionals or educational staff are under, you know, in relation to kind of what supports, what training, what background information they want to be, they want to have uh, to be able to help students. So... Principal Dunn, it was amazing what you said about uh, getting students access to CBT because the curriculum that we focus on training educators in, in schools, is basically a light touch version of the first few sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy, where we say, you know, we want to train you in these skills, give you resources and videos and skill sheets that your students can access independently from elementary through high school, and then make it so that you feel like these skills can be integrated into the classroom without it being more lesson planning for you or more of a, a kind of uh, lift for you. And I think the other thing we talk about a lot, and this is where we don't have as many solutions just yet, is uh, how we improve supply. In that Principal Dunn, six social workers for a school, even though I, I, I hear you that they're spending 80, 90% of their time you know, on crises rather than you know, proactively trying to help students, we spend a lot of time thinking about the schools that have no social workers um, or the schools where uh, there are more social workers than the National Association of Social Workers would recommend for a ratio that social workers can serve, which is one to 250. And we try to support as much as we can programs and, and governmental incentives to give schools funding to put a social worker in the school when, uh, say, you know, that ratio is too high, or trying to figure out how we can uh, look toward um, pay equity and incentives for people to go into the communities that need mental health services the most. Um, so that's, you know, I think some more thing. Thanks for that. I'd, I'd love to just um, to end um, with a thought, a takeaway, a, um, a tidbit, <laughs> something for um, educators who, who might be watching, in particular educators who might feel like they don't have all the tools they need right now in their toolkit to help the students that are in front of them. I wonder if there's a, a resource or an idea or a word of encouragement that um, each of you might, might be able to share. Um, uh, maybe starting with uh, Dr. Clary. Sure. Um, I have I have two things that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, one is that um, the NIH actually put out, I think maybe four four to six months ago, a toolkit of um, mental health videos that are geared towards educating kids and teachers 
on mental health symptoms, where to go for help, um, generally speaking, and they are um, already put together and you can, you know, present them to your class. They're geared towards different ages. Um, they take like, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. So you can do them in a homeroom. So I would say for, for schools that, um, you know, want to do something, but don't have a lot of bandwidth, look, look at the NIH website. Um, I'll actually send these to you so that you can post them. Um, and, you know, looking around for materials, you know, in all the time, spare time that you have, but, you know, there are some materials out there. Um, and then the second thing I'll say real quick is reach out to your, you know, nearest university. Um, they have resources. They often have grant funding. They can come and help. Um, you know, I've been working with uh, Baltimore City Schools to try to help them, um, not just around policies with um, the issues that they've been having with their students, but just, you know, implementing, um, you know, anti-sexual harassment, anti-bullying. Those are the two things on the rise in their schools that they've seen. So, you know, partner with others that might have resources, whether it's in the community or with the university. Thanks. Dr. Jackson? Um, I have one comment and then some re resources. Um, one thing I think we didn't get a chance to talk about as much um, is also thinking about how the social identities of our youth influence their mental health um, and the training that is needed for that. And I, an example of something that um, school systems can do, I worked with a coma project in the fall. We did a workshop for Arlington Public Schools about racial ethnic socialization. We know that racism exists. Um, and so I think when we don't talk about it, we don't teach children about how to have protective factors. What can you do to reduce the buffer? Um, they become adults who struggle even more because they haven't identified it, right? So I think sometimes we forget that when you turn 18, you don't all of a sudden get these adult coping skills magically that appear that they have to be nurtured through youth. And so I think equipping teachers and school counselors, there were school counselors who attended too, um, with the language to be able to support youth so that they can socialize them. Here's some language. What are the messages that we're sending to the youth about racism that they may be, whether it's implicit or explicit, that they're taking in, that is then informing some of the decisions that we're talking about, or is that is then informing how they're feeling emotionally? And so I think what I have found is most often, um, sometimes the teachers and support staff, they feel overwhelmed because they are expected to know everything. And so they're saying, I don't have the tools to support the youth to be able to help them to get the help that they need. And I think that's important, especially when we're talking about how to help um, all of our black and brown youth throughout the country to be able to feel supported with everything that's going on socially. I think additional resources, um, a coma project actually has resources um, where they can connect youth with therapists. I think that that is also important is that there's funding available. So I encourage people to check out the Acoma Project um, website, but they have funding where they can help a youth get connected with a therapist and then it's covered, right? And there are other um, organizations that are able to get that funding as well. And then the Sound It Out Loud project, when we think about innovate, innovation, Sound It Out Loud and the Ad Council is thinking about music, right? What middle schooler or high schooler do you know who doesn't like some form of music? and learning more about how can I learn mindfulness, for example, how can I associate my emotions with music and then listen to people that I admire talking about their emotions. And so there's programs and resources um, through the Sounded Out Loud project too, that gives people a different way. It's not just talking, but thinking about how we use lyrics and music um, for uh, emotional expression. Thank you so much. Dr. Princeton. I think we, we also just want to pay attention to the mental health of educators themselves. You know, the amount of, of stress in a good situation of, of running a classroom or a school, um, but taking care of all of our children and thinking about how to maintain their, their safety from COVID um, and now dealing with such a level of, of mental health concern. Um, this is all happening by these amazing uh, school personnel who have their own families to worry about and their own stressors to be, you know, thinking about. And I think we we might need to recognize that, you know, our our educators out there are are going to be our best um, role models for how to talk about mental health openly. Um, how to talk about coping strategies, even if those are things that are not figured out yet, but how to express it out loud and normalize to their classrooms that yes, we're all feeling, you know, pretty burnt out. And yes, we're all having a hard time. 
with depression or anxiety or loneliness sometimes. And let's share coping strategies. In some ways, that might be some of the best lessons that we can learn in the classroom these days. Um, and it might be a way that that educators themselves can find an opportunity to really you know, model by example how important it is to talk openly and supportive, you know, in a supportive way um, with kids about this now, because unfortunately we're not gonna have an, enough providers to deal with this anytime soon. It could be years. And we have a whole generation of kids right now that need to talk to someone and teachers might need to talk to. Dr. Anderson. Do it quickly, because I know we're running up against time. Uh, three different resources from the Child Mind Institute. First is our website, childmind.org, which has hundreds of articles for parents and educators about a range of mental health and learning disorder topics. Uh, second thing is our California Healthy Minds Thriving Kids Project, which is kind of stemming off of some of the things that Dr. Claire was describing uh, in terms of resources. Uh, this is 34 videos and 60 skill sheets directly for educators and parents, all built separately from the ground up in both English and Spanish. Uh, and adapted to elementary school, middle school, and high school populations. Each of the video and skill sheet sets uh, teaches appropriate age group and language, uh, understanding thoughts, uh, man kind of understanding feelings, managing thoughts, distress tolerance, relaxation skills, uh, and mindfulness. Each video is about five to seven minutes in length and comes with a skill sheet for uh, at home or in school practice. Uh, and that's childmind.org slash healthy minds. And then the last thing I'll just throw out there is that because it's Mental Health Awareness Month uh, and many of us are part of campaigns around this, uh, we have a campaign this month called Dare to Share in which uh, celebrities, patients, uh, young people from our communities are all uh, sharing about uh, their mental health experiences and trying to help break down stigma. And that's just one resource offering kind of hope and support at the moment. And uh, you know, so far, I think my favorite video was pink, but you know, we have a bunch of other people uh, talking about mental health and how they deal with it themselves. Thanks. And Principal Dunn, you get the last word. Yeah, I'll just say on this canvas right over my shoulder here, it reads, just keep living. And it's signed by every black mama. And I think families carry that burden. Um, and I'll, I'll say two things. I'll say one um, to educators and, and just adults. Um, we all have the opportunity to positively impact the lives of young people every single day. Um, and whether it's a small or whether it's a big way. And so that could be just asking kids, how are you doing or saying good morning? And that could be sharing resources with young people. So when they are experiencing a crisis or they need support, they know where to go. I'll also encourage um, schools and organizations to think and act boldly, um, both in service of students and also in service of adults. Um, who are educating students. And I'll tell you um, that I noticed this year um, in the wake of the social and political climate, the impacts of gun violence, the impacts of the pandemic, my educators were struggling and understandably so, and myself included. Um, this was a very tough past 18 months. Um, and one of the things that we did um, in the, by way of acting boldly is that we contracted um, with a therapist in our community um, to provide counseling services during the day to all of our staff members, and we completely covered the cost. So we removed the barriers of an educator having to walk out of the building um, and find the time with all of their competing priorities, or for some of our staff members to figure out how they were going to pay the copay. We covered that, um, and we removed those barriers, and we offered that access to therapy in our school building. Um, and I think that's one way that we showed our staff that we wanted to prioritize their mental health. And I think there are other things that we can do and that other people can do. And so I hope, you know, that as a community, we hold each other accountable um, because, you know, sometimes there are budgetary limitations, but we need to hold each other accountable to doing all the things we can and work collectively. Um, because at the end of the day, I hope that all the folks who are working and serving communities that we serve can say that we did everything that we could to protect the lives of young, uh, of young individuals, uh, specifically the lives of young black and brown individuals. Thank you all so, so much for that and for your time today. We at Chalkbeat are so grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you to the members of the panel we just heard from and to our College Track scholars for sharing their insights and perspectives 
on a topic that has such critical importance, both within our individual lives and within our greater communities. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this really important conversation. And I also encourage you to learn more about College Track, about our scholars, about our movement to truly democratize potential. Please visit collegetrack.org. I hope that this conversation has given you something to think about, as well as some strategies and resources to help facilitate well being in your schools and beyond. Thanks again to all of our excellent panelists, to our Chalkbeat journalists, and presenting sponsors at College Track. As one of our student panelists so eloquently stated, we are people first. Let's take care of ourselves. Let's take care of each other. To read more about mental health supports and needs for teachers and students, please visit chalkbeat.org.